Uh, the song I sang this morning is one of my songs. I'm, I'm, I sing, okay? I've done a few songs. Some of them in the studio, some of them in my bathroom, some of them I do them while driving. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. In a conference like this, I would hope to bless you with my songs. So can you remember this morning my heart cries out for the almighty my heart cries out for the almighty my heart cries out for the almighty clap for yourself you got it <laughs> okay oh lord let your glory fill this house. Somebody get on the drums. Oh Lord, let your glory fill this house. Oh Lord, let your glory fill this house. Oh Lord, let your glory fill house as we say this is what we ask for this is what we hunger for this is what we pray for every day this is what we reach for this is what we ask for this is what we hunger for this is what we pray for every day. This is what we reach for. Oh Lord, let your glory fill my life. Oh Lord, let your glory fill my life. Oh Lord, let your glory fill my life. Oh, Lord, my life oh lord let your glory fill my life as i say this is what we ask for this is what we hunger for this is what we pray for every day this is what we reach for this is what we ask for this is what we hunger for this is what we pray for every day this is what we reach for my heart cries out for the almighty my heart cries out for the almighty my heart cries out Can you join at that point? Huh? My heart cries out for the Almighty. My heart cries out for the Almighty. My heart cries out for the Almighty. Oh, yeah, Bocanusi, Kalega, Manates, Perando Zikra, and Stoic as Bosonita. Leviba konishu kenita saliki tanata. Eranduzi klavrak de anda shukle via banosi kata. Mena bronde galatia vositaneta. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Almighty Father. We are hungry for you tonight. You will satisfy us yet once more with a satisfied dissatisfaction. I will leave here reaching for more and getting more filled because our capacity is enlarging. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Did I hear your amen? amen. Hallelujah. Um, thank you again, Apostle and uh, Apostoles. <laughs> we say prophet and prophetess, have you? 
Okay, so there should be apostle and apostoless. Thank you so much for your warm hospitality. Your hospitality people, your protocol people are... I'm here with my wife of 24 years. Reverend Franca, please, can you join me upstage and say hi to the people? I, li I like celebrating my wife, oh, so help me. Uh, okay, they're doing well. Okay. 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 We met in this town 27 years ago. We got married 24 years ago. Uh, if there's one reason, there are many, many reasons. But if there are, there's one major reason I don't regret coming to Benue State, she's the one. He said, you shall eat the fruit of the land. She's a good fruit of the land. If you are from Benue, let me say to you, she has represented you well in my house. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm so glad I found her and she found me. So please, can you say a word of greeting? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, we are so delighted to be here this year at this conference. Um, I wasn't here. I couldn't be here this morning, but I, I joined online, and um, it was a great time. I heard the apostle teach, and I'm so delighted to be present live here this evening. Okay. Um, I just want to say this. We have prayed for you um, in preparation for this meeting. And our prayer is that God will visit you significantly in such a way that it will change the trajectory of your life. And for some of you, God has already started to walk in you. I want you to know that during this meeting, he's going to be adding another layer to what he's already doing. I just want you to tune in and don't be distracted. I want to use this opportunity to appreciate Apostle Arume and Reverend Dina Osai for having us. God bless you. We appreciate you. And God bless you. We love you. Hallelujah. Thank you. That's my first lady. You see, when I got married, it was not very popular in this town to celebrate your wife. So my ways were a bit strange to some people. And my, the challenge with dealing with me is that you can't shut me up. Criticism does not move me, neither does praise. You praise me, I am the same. You criticize me, I am the same. So now you go tired. Just leave me and my God to do what we are doing. If you find that I'm wrong, either talk to my spiritual father or talk to my God. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, yes. <laughs> but I found out that by doing what I do, a lot of people just flowed into it. And it became quite a culture before we left this place. Uh, so I say to ministers present, don't leave your wife behind. One of the reasons I love Apostle Arame is that I see him with his wife, even on major billboards. No, it speaks very loudly. Now, sometimes Paul said, I speak this by the Holy Ghost. Then some other times you say, I speak it as one that God has trusted with ministry. So this one now I'm speaking as God has trust, one God has trusted with ministry. He is not us here, the Lord. Uh, but uh, when a pastor or a minister leaves his wife behind, I, su I start suspecting you somehow. So it's not as if that suspicion is right. 
but sometimes it becomes right most of the time. Why are you hiding her? So that others can have easy access to you. That's all. That's my conclusion. Because your wife standing by you is already level one protection. <laughs> An unoccupied space can easily be occupied. I'm not looking for substitutes. So when your wife stands by you, the women in the congregation quickly defined their role. And their role now includes her by you. If she's not by you, they quickly also define their role and put themselves between you and her. And then you may be complaining that your wife is not understanding. The female gender, ah, how they quite serious matter. There are some things you find with them. I mean, the great Catherine Kuhlman. I have read several of her biographies. And several of them said nobody knew how old she was until the day she died. As anointed and Holy Ghost filled as she was, she still had that female tendency not to declare age. Most people were shocked when they found she was 68 or 69. They thought she was 58 or 59. They estimated her age. Somebody went to her hometown church to check the register. That's when the true age. You ask her, she'll just giggle and do some of those girly things and walk away. She never confirmed to you how old she was. So there are some things that are just femininity or femininity. That's just how God wired them. So can I tell you another thing about femininity? They're extremely territorial. If you don't let your wife occupy her space, another woman will occupy it. And then you start blaming her that she's not understanding. Some of you have created tension in your ministries and you think it's your wife that needs to change. Go back and change her. Go back and change. Because you are all honorable men and women of God. I didn't tell your neighbor to pull your ears and warn you for me. Uh -huh. Go back and change. Let her occupy her space. Her role is difficult enough already without you complicating it with your male arrogance. <laughs> I hope I still have friends to preach this message. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say I should balance it. <laughs> I like these people. <laughs> I like these people. Okay, what is the balance of this one? <laughs> Madam, follow your husband. In my experience, 99.9% .9 of marital mistakes begin from the man. Poor leadership. Poor leadership. Do you want the balance? Give her room to talk. We were in a conference. We were, let me give you how it works. We were in a conference. I was speaking. And I said, a marriage rises and falls on the leadership of the man. Then she was to speak after me. She came and said, a marriage rises and falls on the support of the woman. Fortunately for the conference, I had the mic to talk after she talked. I said, both of us are correct. The worst attitude to marriage is to want your spouse corrected when you have not corrected yourself. So what I said, I'm saying to the men, it has nothing to do with the women here. I say I'm under authority here. You can't beat me. He won't allow the protocol he will to let you beat me. So don't provoke me to say more. <laughs> the, the whole thing is about taking responsibility. 
occupy your space as a man. And part of that is taking command of your territory and handing it over to your wife. And she doesn't have to be perfect before you do that. You behave yourself. It's because of this your temper that I don't allow you space in this place. If Jesus did that with the church, demons would still be sitting on our neck. We grow through our struggles. Please, God has already done enough to me in the car coming here now. Don't do more. Because I had my message planned and he changed it. <laughs> <laughs> so do not come and add your own and I will start doing marriage ministry when that's not why I came so that we're not leaving here by 12 midnight because again once I handle the mic now you go tired I never wear out standing here I don't get tired so if you lead me on we'll do one and a half hours marriage ministry and I'll still come back and preach what God said I should preach <laughs> So, let's just leave the matter, okay? The balance is that when you lead your wife well, she follows you well. If you want to hear the female side of it, I'm not the one to say it. She will say it. Glory to God. Amen. Okay. Yes, I know there's a balance to it. I'm not saying there's no balance to it. I'm just saying this is not the forum for that. Is that okay? Uh-huh. Like I said this morning, Delilah has never helped any Samson. Mm. There's no need to be a Jezebel by the side of your Ahab. There's no need. Amen. No, no one more. <laughs> rise up, rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. Rise up on your feet. Lift your two hands to the Lord. And just tell him welcome. When we say that, it's not because he has to go and come. We're tuning ourselves to him. We're tuning our attention back to him. Spirit of the sovereign Lord. Come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the risen Lamb. Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, come and make your presence known, reveal the glory of the risen Lamb. Let the rain of your glory cover us. Let the life of your river flow. Let the truth of your kingdom reign in us. Let the rain of your glory let the rain of your glory fall. Let the rain of your glory. Let the rain of your glory fall. Lord, you are in charge in this place. Take us beyond where we stopped this morning. Take us deeper. Fill it up more. Let Jesus be glorified and his people edified in Jesus' mighty name. You can please be seated in God's presence. I announced this morning that I was going to be preaching tonight on the, the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus. It's one of my favorite topics. But and while I'm still preaching on the same topic, the content is what changed right in the car on our way. You see, in Isaiah 61, the prophet said, the spirit of Adonai Yahovah is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. 
the Lord that anoints is called Adonai Yahovah. Or to call it more directly in the way you understand, Adonai Jehovah. Adonai is master, lord, ruler. Combine that with God. And in my own expression, the God that bosses you around. If you won't let him boss you around, he won't anoint you. So working with God is, has technicalities. You have to stay open at all times. Now I felt the quickening of the spirit more than two weeks ago when I was praying. I prayed, prayed, prayed for a number of days. There was nothing. Then I was driving and suddenly it dropped. And I knew from that time it, I'll be speaking on the God of grace and the grace of God. Glory to God. Uh, but I didn't know I would be teaching it from this angle. I downloaded it differently. So he has to stay Lord so that he can do what he wants. You see, God is not an Anglican. How many of you were Ang Anglicans? Now he likes the Anglican church. I'm not saying he doesn't like it. It's like he likes every one of us. But there's this Anglican benediction that is unscriptural. As it was, help me now, Please, lady, can you stand up and say it loud? Please, please. Okay, you're an Anglican. Okay. As it was in the beginning, so it is now and ever shall be world without. Come, tell me the theology of that. Tell me the theology of that. God is always moving and you better move with him. That's why some people are stuck in their ways. Yes, they truly heard God in 1995 and they stopped hearing God because the encounter was so profound. God continues talking but they ignored him. Peter made that mistake on the Mount of Transfiguration when he saw the tangible cupboard. They were fell asleep, woke up and saw Jesus in the glory with Elijah and Moses. Those are the two most iconic figures in Israel's history. So how better can it get? I mean, the era of Jesus, the Son of God, and here is Moses and here is Elijah. Ah! Peter rose up and said, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tabernacles. One for you, Lord Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Let's camp here. This glory, too much. You see, those who have tasted past revivals, are the easiest to miss a fresh wave. I am not missing this wave. I'm in the heart of it. <laughs> Your invitation was one of the confirmations that I'm in the heart of this revival. I've tested revivals before now, but there's a fresh wave in town. And this is one of the carriers of that wave. In fact, maybe I should tell you a little bit about Apostle Aaron. Should I? Yeah. When I came into Benue State in 1994, the first thing I do did, apart from territorial mapping, to see which devils we needed to deal with, there's also a spiritual territorial mapping that has to do with God's plan for the land. And I encountered prophecies dating back to the 50s and 60s about some things God wanted to do here. And as an intercessor, we prayed over these matters, myself and my team, for years. But while I was here, I never really saw the manifestation in the way God was showing us in the Spirit. When I walked in here this morning, I said, oh, it has started. This is it. <laughs> what am I telling you? This man, this ministry here has been prophesied since the 50s and 60s. Not by one mouth or two mouths, several mouths. You see, as a man of God, I try to link back to what started before I came. It's the fuel and energy for going forward. 
It is. It is. Years ago, I was preaching in local and an old woman came to me. Very old woman. Came in the healing line with tears in her eyes to tell me some of the prayers my grandfather, who died as a Baptist elder, prayed for years and she never saw it happen with his children, though he kept praying for his children. She had tears in her eyes when she held my, my collar and said, I can see that you are the fulfillment of your grandfather's prayers. I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten that. While it is strategic, when God connects you to a flow that started before you, it also, sometimes God shuffles the cards and looks for the person that has proven faithfulness and has the greatest propensity to carry it far. So there's a human contribution that needs to be celebrated. You are all here because he arose. There was a man of God called, what is his name? Andrew Murray, the South African man. Very great teacher of the late 19th century and great intercessor. He wrote books on prayer, wrote books on the Holy Spirit. He had a prayer meeting running for years where they were praying for the fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, like on the day of Pentecost. But when the Holy Spirit showed up at Azusa Street, he rejected it because the Holy Ghost did not wear the garments he intended the Holy Ghost to wear. We, it, this, it's a dangerous territory. And then he, saw, he missed out on the whole outpouring. He was still alive way into the Pentecostal outpouring, but never participated because he rejected the, the, the packaging. You see, God is God. That's why we call him God. How many of you know when we call him God, we're not hailing him? We are not actually, we're not hyping him up. My son is 17 now, so he's trying to grow into a man and show his chest. <laughs> but in those days when he was like six, seven, I like winding his head. I say, you're a man. Then he'll pull his shirt and show one tiny muscle. So I'm a man. You know, some of the healing they give you is the abyss. You know that. They're just mocking you. And sometimes we think when we praise God and call him God, we are trying to make him feel good. Whether you call him God or not, he's God. He is God. That's why we call him God. And he walks all things Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 according to the counsel of his own will. His will is his only counselor. Who has known the mind of God that he may instruct him? And say, but we have the mind of Christ. When you have the mind of Christ, you can instruct him. And you think he is obeying you. No, 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 no. It was in his counsel. That is why he is responding to you. Whether you like this packaging or not, let me announce to you, generations of Christians in Benue State, some of them who won't even respond to this now, have cried out to God for this. And thank God it is here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell you. And all these things I'm saying in bits and pieces are connected. John chapter 1. One of my favorite passages of scripture. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life and this life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Okay, NKJV, let me stick with that. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came as a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to everyone coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. To them he gave the right 
the exousia, to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh. Mm -hmm. And dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did you see grace there? Did you see grace there? The glory as the, of, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. Can I hear you say, full of grace and truth? Verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Get ready to give me verse 16 in the Amplified, but let's go to 17 first in NKJV. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Verse 15. 14, 15, 17. Grace, grace, grace. Go back to 16 and give it to me in the Amplified. For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth, because grace and truth is what he talked about in verse 14. We have all received grace upon grace, spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing favor upon favor and gifts heaped upon gifts mark it we have all received mark it we have all received pay close attention so that you don't miss the most vital thing in this very short message it's going to be quite short compared to your expectation The law came by Moses. The grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Does it mean the law was not true? Somebody asked me that once. It was gnosis, but not epignosis. What is gnosis? Partial knowledge. Incomplete knowledge. And Paul said in Corinthians, Gnosis puffs up. When you have partial knowledge, it makes you proud. It makes you puffed up. So when you see somebody that is pompous with knowledge, it is gnosis they have. When you have epignosis, accurate, precise, full knowledge on any subject, you are humble about it. Because the wisdom of God is easy to be entreated. Again, back to my message this morning. That's what I found with them. They were so arrogant. They won't want you to even reason with them. They react. Which is this doctrine of grace that suddenly turns you hostile against the brethren. And everyone that doesn't do it like you do it is looked down upon. It was gnosis. It's because they refused the balance. Because once it becomes full, you become humble. And it is at the place of fullness that grace flows. Can I hear an amen? In the year of our Lord, 2000 and... Uh, what year was that? 2005 and four. I took a study on the anointing. Actually, what happened was that I read Benny Hinn's book on the anointing. I had read Good Morning Holy Spirit in the 90s. Now, I found that there was another one called the anointing. So, I read it. It was so interesting. I decided to study the subject for myself. And that was before search engines. That was before soft copy Bibles. They were not common. So, we had concordance. When a teacher sits down to study there, it was a beautiful sight. You had about three Bible translations. Then you have Bible dictionary, you have Bible concordance, you have Strong's exhaustive dictionary of uh, Greek and Hebrew words. So you needed a large table to be a teacher in those days. I had a friend in those days that even when he's coming to the pulpit, he packs them. That's how he carries them. So he can't, okay, he can teach in a pulpit like this because two can be here and another one here. He spreads them out. 
when you see him you know he's a teacher rabbi I've stood in the teacher's office longest since 1989 so this is the office probably I understand the most because the anointing that abides in you teaches you there are three okay there are more than three actually but let me talk about three operations of a teacher analytic teaching is what I like doing the most precept upon precept line upon line a little here a little there you let scripture interpret scripture you look at the panorama of truth and bring out the juice that God wants you to bring out on that particular occasion so in analytic teaching you are balancing as you go it is possible in one hour to arrive at a conclusion that is balanced but there is also interpretive teaching the kind I am going to do tonight I don't do it much there is also an expression of the teacher's office. Interpreting, interpretive teaching deals with symbolisms, types and shadows that are in the scriptures. So the accuracy of interpretive teaching is dependent on the degree of accuracy to which you have understood the word analytically. So if the man interpreting is not deep in analytic knowledge, his interpretive power is poor but because he is anointed people will still believe him yeah when you stand under your anointing people's hearts it blasts them open to receive what you say so when you listen to interpretive teaching the only way for you to stay balanced is to have bible in you with which to compare to what is being said there's expository teaching which is common around here a lot and I won't talk much about that. Glory to God. So I've issued a disclaimer that what my teaching tonight is based is interpretive. Interpretive. Thank you media for highlighting we have all received. The New Testament was written to give us a road map with which to explore other truths in the Old Testament that were not explored by the apostles or they didn't have time to write about. They wrote enough for us to have a clear road map. Now, when you start looking at the Old Testament from a New Testament standpoint, you, you notice one major difference. What was in the future in their time is either present tense or past tense in our time. So Isaiah says, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5, talking about the passions of the Christ, by whose stripes ye are healed. When Peter picked that up in 1 Peter 2.24, he said, by whose stripes you were healed. And sometimes when you want to receive healing by your own faith, that is the only reason people struggle. While the pain and the discomfort is still in your body, you have to count it done and put it in the past tense. You start celebrating it like it is done, then it gets done. Oh, and that may look simple, but if you know the number of Christians that are wrestle with it. I know Christians that are mighty in the kind of prayer I'm describing right now that don't understand the simple prayer of faith. Of what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that he received them and he shall have them. What does that mean? Count it done and God will get it done. It's not everything you can pray into. Some things are written in plain language. You just count it done. And start celebrating them. And praying over them and celebrating them. And God causes a manifestation. When it comes to operating in the fullness of grace, I found that that is what is expected of us. Now the scripture that says, whatsoever the Lord doeth, it shall be forever. Anything that op originates from God has eternity in his DNA. So if God starts something, it never stops. It never stops. It never stops. So every operation of God you have ever seen in the Bible is still available. 
But revelation is progressive. And God has been dealing with man progressively. And the fullness of his dealings is in the New Testament when his son came and paid the perfect price. But if you as a child of God choose to operate with God at the level of Job, Job, God will accommodate you there. And you see the reality of Job at God's level. At, at the reality of God at Job's level. But mark you, Job was even like 400 years before the law. So Job is inferior to the law of Moses. Yes. The operations of Moses were superior to what Job encountered and experienced. Are, are you understanding me? And if you choose now to operate at the level of the law, those operations are still very available. But you will not be experiencing the fullness of the New Testament. But you see, there are certain characters in the Bible that have such insight due to intimacy that they lived beyond their season. A good example is David. David lived under the law, but enjoyed massive unlimited mercy and grace out of intimacy. David was the only one that could put the ark in an open place where all Israel could see it and nobody died. But that's, a, that's after Uzzah died. In the days of Moses, only the high priest sees the ark once a year. After the days of Moses, when Solo took over, remember Uncle Solo? <laughs> the same scenario was enacted because Solomon didn't have that degree. So the ark again entered into a holy of holies where only the high priest sees it once a year. But in David's day, the ark was in a tabernacle. And the sons of Asaph, the sons of Jeduthun, and all those people surrounded it with 24 hours praise schedule. And so the glory became tangible and bearable when God was continually being celebrated. You don't murmur in the presence of glory. You fall down and die. That is the original fall down and die. And David tapped into that. And if you go to Ezekiel, God began to long for prophetically. For He said in the last days, I'll restore the tabernacle of Moses. <laughs> okay. I said, okay. What I'm saying to you is that when you meet a man who operates differently from what I'm teaching, it's okay. As long as you're getting results from it, it's okay. What I don't what I will always argue with is emptiness, no results. And you're arguing. Who gave you mouth? As long as you have results, you don't want to grow forward, at least you are producing some results for the Lord. But no New Testament Christian, in my understanding, ever needs to pray for the anointing. Send down your power. We pray you, O Lord. Send down the Holy Ghost. We say, Amen. Very beautiful songs. Now, I ran my concordance and I could only find, is it four or five scriptures using the word unction or anointing in the New Testament? And I was like, wait, 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 wait. If this is so important, how come that word is not that present in the New Testament scriptures? I sought God about it and he said, okay, go back to your Bible, study the word grace and life, charis and zoe. That is how I operate here. That's how I operate under this covenant. So when we are talking about grace, it is the familiar word anointing we are talking about. That is the New Testament word for supernatural power. Power, supernatural endowment, supernatural enablement. That is the New Testament word. And when you come into Christ, of his fullness, have we all received him. Of his fullness. We're going to go back to that scripture over and over again, so always keep it there. We have all received 
when you received Christ, you received the fullness of his grace. That's what he came to deliver to you. That is why Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says, those that have received abundance of grace, not that those that we receive, those that have received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Grace and righteousness always go together. They shall reign in this life. They shall reign over the curse. They shall reign over sickness and disease. They shall reign over demons, devils, and evil spirits. They shall reign in this life because of abundance of grace. You already have it. Talking about spiritual gifts, Ephesians 1.3 gives us another witness Ephesians 1 3 blessed worthy of praise okay blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has present tense blessed us past tense with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places there's no spiritual blessing you don't already have give me the amplified give me the amplified he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. Okay, this is the new amplified. The old amplified puts in bracket every blessing given by the Holy Spirit. Yes, that's it. Every blessing given by the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost came into you, he came with all the gifts and the graces that you will ever need in your lifetime. So it is not send down your power. When we talk about outpourings of the Spirit, God does not pour down His Spirit anymore. He poured Him down on the day of Pentecost. And He has not gone back for 2,000 years. He, Jesus Himself said, Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Joel chapter 2 says, In the last days, I will pour out not I will pour down. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Because he knew in the last days, once he is poured down once, he abides in all the saints. So our only tax now is the release process. Is the release process. Is the release process. Oh, I'm just imagining what could happen. If out of this congregation, at least a hundred to two hundred or three hundred or five hundred men of God and women of God from different parts of this nation and the world catch this glory to God when you go back to where you are coming from Satan will hear something and that's my desire here tonight and that's the prayer myself and my dear wife have been praying for you before we got here to go forth and manifest sonship sonship dominion I was in Lafayette two years ago and I had a training session for ministers on Saturday morning on how to operate in the supernatural. I taught them for four or five hours straight. I like those kind of teachings. Now, when, at the beginning of the meeting, the PFN chairman got up and said, uh, let me say something, man of God, if you see me going at the end, I mean, before, while you are speaking, please don't be annoyed. I have three engagements today. I put them on hold just to come and register my presence here because as the head of Pentecostals in this town, I don't want it to be said you came here and I ignored the meeting. So I got up and I appreciated him and started my teaching. Five hours later, he was still there. And by the time we were through, Nothing less than four of the ministers present started miracle meetings that are still running in their churches. You can do it. God intended for us to announce Jesus with miracles. He intended for us to announce Jesus with signs, wonders, and miracles. And we are all carriers of the Spirit of Christ. And you can learn to turn him loose. Turn him loose. The first operation in the spirit that helps you turn him loose is understanding exousia. 
understanding exousia. That flow, exousia, E X O U S I A, E X O U S I A. That's the authority of God. For us, it is packaged in the name Jesus. Jesus. Exousia is released through revelation knowledge. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Accurate understanding of your place in Christ releases you into exousia. Now whether it is released or not, you have it already. Of his fullness have you received. Jesus didn't give you a quarter of himself. He gave you all of him. He gave you all of him. One of the most important books I ever read. I read it over 30 years ago. Very small book. I recommend it for everybody here. Watch my knee. Sit, walk, stand. Who has read that book? Sit, walk, stand. This is a knowledgeable crowd. Tap into those ancient wells. Simple teaching from the book of Ephesians. You know, sometimes when you are teaching from the sitting position, you can easily use extreme statement but that makes it look like the walk is not necessary. And when you are teaching from the walk experience, you can make it look as if the sit, sitting is not a reality. You have to struggle to sit. What I just said now is from the seat position. Is who you already are. Your prayer, your fasting does not improve it or increase it. You just have to accept that what God said about you is true. Of his fullness I have received. Oh, I, I thought you would confess that. Can you say I have received the fullness of Christ? The day I gave my life to Christ, the fullness of Christ came into me. I have been blessed already. With every Holy Spirit given blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And some people only teach the stand. Standing against the devil. It's always warfare. No nation fights all the time. Say amen. And I've seen people teach seat until they can't even fight. So the whole thing is still about balance. Examine all the spectrum of truth, of truth. Because what I'm about to teach, if you are not already seated, assuming your place, can put you into tr struggles. What makes what I'm about, what releases grace on what I'm about to teach is the understanding of your place in Christ. That this process I'm going through is not to get something. Is to release what is already in me. To release the gifts and graces that are already locked up in my inner man. Now the Old Testament, Tabernacle of Moses. I'll use that as my illustration tonight. Because that analogy runs through scriptures. There's always three graduation of things. The angels in heaven cry, holy, holy, holy. Illustrating that truth. God is a triumph God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Illustrating that truth. You are packaged as a trinity yourself, spirit, soul, and body. Illustrating that truth. The tabernacle of Moses and the temple of Solomon. Outer court, holy place, holy of holies. Illustrating that truth. So it's an established truth in scriptures. There are three graduations of things. Now in the Old Testament... The outer court was for everybody. That is, that's where you had the, uh, the altar and the lover. The priests are then ministering and Israel brings their sin offerings, their burnt offerings and all those sacrifices and the priests administer them at the altar. It was a daily thing. It was such a rigorous job that by the time you were 50 as a priest, you were forced to retire. Retirement age for priests was 50. Not 60. It's not Nigerian civil service. Because at 50, you were burnt out. 
It was rigorous. Now again, one of the extremes of what I was talking about this morning was a description of the Day of Atonement as the only requirement for relationship. There was the Day of Atonement where the high priest offered sacrifices to cover the sins of the Jewish nation so that the Jewish nation can maintain relationship with God. That does not cover daily work. When David sinned with Beersheba, he took sin sacrifices to be offered by the priest before God. That covers the work. The people that teach you that a Christian never has to confess sins again. If you ever sin, just say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Smoke, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Do tramadol, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. So never admit that you sin. I mean, somebody said that. Somebody said that. I said, where did you get it? I said, First John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, no, no, no. First John chapter 1 was written to agnostics. Chapter 2 is the one that belongs to us. Chapter 2 to 5. What kind of misunderstanding of scripture is that? I didn't let him go that day until he promised me he was going to read the New Testament from cover to cover afresh. Because when I said, why? why are you he said, have I read so-and-so book? You don't make conclusions from somebody else's book when the scriptures are plain before you. We still confess sin. There's a daily cleansing that still takes place. Though we have been perfected in his sight. See, the day of atonement in the New Testament was a once and for all event. But the daily sacrifices. Now, it's only we are not sacrificing animals. We plead the blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Clean set. Present tense continuous. First John chapter 1 verse 5. Clean set us from all sin. How many times will God forgive you? How many times? One day I was reading scriptures and I came across uh, the, the story in the gospel of according to St. Luke. It's in Matthew 18 also. And Jesus said, if your brother sin against you seven times, 70 times, forgive him. I was young in faith then, so I used to react when I'm alone with God. Because God is my daddy, okay? I don't know how you relate with him. Hmm? It's not just my car, BC. It's also my daddy. It's my father. Abba, father, actually means daddy, daddy. Go and examine the roots of Abba. It's an intimate word. So I, I bring the Bible and I say, Father, this is unfair. How do you expect me to forgive somebody 490 times? In one day, Luke said one day, which means the following day, <laughs> if I counted 489 and was getting ready for my revenge and the day the sun set and to start counting afresh the following day not even your spouse that lives in the same house with you can sin against you that many in 24 hours I said but this is unfair how do you expect us to live like that and a few times sometimes I ask the Holy Spirit questions and I hear him laughing Every time I say that, some people don't understand it. Maybe your God is too serious. He doesn't laugh. But Psalm 2 says, he that sits in heaven shall laugh. He laughs in some circumstances. I say, Lord, why are you laughing? He said, you are applying it wrongly. You should be rejoicing. I said, why? How? He said, if I expect you to forgive your brother 490 times in one day, what do you think I will do for you? I would have to forgive you a minimum of 491 times to remain God. Because if I expect more from you than me, then I've, you have become God. So I don't know how many times God will forgive you. But 490 times in one day minimum. You see why people can take it for granted now? And just say, let's just sing so that grace may abound. He didn't give you that lavish, unlimited mercy. So that you will do that. He gave it to you so that the devil can trap you. 
Nothing destroys sin like a guilt complex. Hear me. And I, that's why I hate the spirit of religion. Because religion emphasizes the guilt complex. It is guilt to control people. And people only feel spiritual when they are feeling guilty. There's a difference between being in the spirit and feeling condemned. Your tears are not a revelation of repentance. You can have remorse and you are not repenting. When Peter denied Christ, he went outside, wept bitterly, and it was repentance. Because between the re death of Jesus Christ and the day of Pentecost, for just 50 days, 50 days later, he stood boldly as an apostle and preached the first apostolic message under the anointing with a totally clear conscience. Went as far as accusing them of the sin he committed on the day of crucifixion. He said, you deny the just and the holy one. And the anointing was on him. I mean, you know the devil's tactics. I am sure as Peter stepped up to talk, that little girl that challenged him came to the front of the crowd. That's, I know the devil. His tactics have not changed. Let me see how you will say this thing. He still said it, oblivious of her presence, because he had a clear conscience, devoid of offense toward God and man, because the blood had washed him. <laughs> he caught the revelation. So you don't steal in the juice of your sin and now try to atone for your sins. That's what gave rise to this Permit me to say demonic doctrine of penance. Yes, very demonic. It's not New Testament revelation. If you can make up for the sins of your past, tell me why Jesus died. Because Peter, James and Peter both confirmed it. That if you make effort to do one, you have to do all. So if you have to make effort to correct one sin of ten years ago, you have to go back throughout your whole lifetime and correct every sin you have ever committed. And that is impossible. What is past is past. So please, let it pass. They didn't hear me there. What is past is past. So please, let it pass. Most Christians get defeated because they can't get over themselves. They say, God has not forgiven me. No, 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 you are the one that's not forgotten, forgiven yourself. You are listening to the voice of the accuser. His messages are new every morning. His messages get renewed every morning. He didn't put a limit and I'm not going to put a limit. I'm not going to put a limit. So you are free to walk with a clear conscience. What you must never do is to do something wrong and your conscience registers it and you justify it. Again, there's a difference. Okay, the parallel I was running was that Judas also felt bad that he sold Jesus. The Bible said he was remorseful, that he went and hung himself. That's the spirit of religion. Spirit of religion said, a, a meke. Judas or more is carried Now, when people hear of this stupid thing I have done, they will not respect me again. Oh, pari, I will kill myself. And he cried himself. Okay, where is Judas right now? Do you need prophecy to know he went to hell? Where is Peter right now? So that sin you can't walk away from is Satan's greatest trap for you. And what you don't forgive yourself of, you will keep repeating. But let me warn you, there's a difference between repentance also and apology. Some people do not repent, and that's why they keep repeating. They see the blood of Jesus as justification. So when they sin, they just apologize to God. And those are the kind of people that will call Jesus, Bros. J. Bros. J, I really, uh, but you know, I'm a man. It's these things, we are humans. That's why sometimes we get overtaken. I'm sorry, eh? Sorry, oh. As long as you are giving excuses that justify the action and the deed, that was an apology. That wasn't repentance. 
And you wonder why you can't walk away? So you keep abusing grace. Grace is there so that you can be free. Not so that you can tie yourself with chains, bounds, or bondages. Hallelujah. Of his fullness have we all received. Can we say I've received its fullness? The fullness of his grace and mercy. Unlimited in quantity. Unlimited in quantity. I don't have to beg for it. I don't have to cry to get it. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 4, and verse 16 says, Let us therefore, can you give it to me in my usual translation? Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. That word obtain, not that we may beg for mercy, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, I, I agree with the things of God this way. I was on campus as a discipler. That was my first role in fellowship. So when people give their life to Christ, they give us. And two ladies were given to me who gave their life to Christ the first day. The preaching that day was hot. One wept from her seat. She threw herself on the floor. Oh, people were holding her. The other one just walked to the altar. And prayed the sinner's prayer. The crier prayed the sinner's prayer too. I had a chance to observe the two of them in trying to disciple them. Before one year was over, the lady who did not cry was a full-fledged, vibrating, strong Christian bearing fruit of, on campus. Two years after that encounter, this one other lady, we were still struggling to separate her and her boyfriend. And she finally backslid and married an unbeliever. No, tell me, who really repented that day? You are trying to impress your neighbor. So some things don't impress me. If you want to cry, cry. That's between you and God. If you want to laugh, laugh. That's between you and God. That doesn't make me count you serious or unserious. Because most of this time, these things are expressions of temperament anyway. <laughs> They're just expressions of temperament. Glory to God. I say glory to God. So this is a scripture you must own. You can come boldly at any time. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days in a year to the throne of grace. And there you take mercy. Obtain means just take it. When you need it, it's available. And when you obtain mercy, that's when you find grace. Grace is one step beyond mercy. And what is grace? It's the unmerited favor of God, but it's also the ability of God coming upon your ability, making you able to do what you could not have done before his ability came upon your ability. So you and some guys could have seen together, even robbed the bank, but your heart smote you, and you broke down in your closet and genuinely repented. The following day, they bring your own share of the money. You won't even be tempted. You won't. It's not let me spend it and repent after this one later. No, when the heart changes, the deed becomes distasteful. When you really obtain mercy, you find grace. Suddenly, you are not the same person again. The ability of God is upon your ability. That weakness becomes past tense. So I became wary of teachings that just keep me in one place of guilt. Crying and repeating. Repenting of once in ten times. First John chapter 1 verse 9 did not say, if you confess and confess and confess and confess and confess and confess, oh, confess again. Then confess, weep a little, weep a little, weep a little, add a little fasting, confess, confess. Then finally, this hard-hearted God will say, make a mercy for this boy. Then he will forgive your trespasses. That's not first John chapter 1, verse 9, no. Once there's a genuine repentance and a confession of sin, the scripture says he is faithful and just to forgive you. 
Which means if at that point he refuses to forgive you, he's been unfaithful. Unfaithful to who? Unfaithful to the covenant he has with Jesus Christ. And God is not unfaithful. He will keep his part of the deal. Just. He is faithful and just. Just means righteous or, or I mean, equity. Justice. It will be unjust for God not to forgive a sin truly repented and confessed of. Unjust, yes. A good judge can't punish one sin two times. Yeah, the justice system does not repeatedly punish the same offense. And all your offenses have been punished in Christ. So the moment you repent and call upon his name, the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, clings at you from all sin. And then he says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17, and your sins and iniquities are remember no more. He puts it out of sight and will treat you like a man that has never sinned. I like James chapter 1 verse 2. Or is it verse 2 or 5? The Amplified Translation. If any man asks, if any man, if any man, and this is what defeats people's faith, that they can't pray. If any man is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God. He is called what? The giving God. It is his nature to give. Who gives to everyone? Are you part of everyone? Are you part of everyone? Liberally and ungrudgingly, without reproaching or fault finding. Let me demonstrate that to you. Sir, can you stand up? Yes. Walk up here and just ask me to forgive you of something. Just imagine something. So, so, forgive me for stealing your goats. <laughs> now, something as frivolous as that. So that somebody here doesn't think you are talking about real things. Can I hear you? Say, please forgive me for stealing your goat. Forgive me for stealing your goat. Oh. Uh, you want me to forgive you for stealing my goat. But you know this is the fifth time you are stealing a goat from me. <laughs> so tell me how many times I will keep forgiving you. Your cup is almost full. Oh. <laughs> I will soon deal with you. Reproaching and fault finding. Did you get it? Yes, you, got, don't, you don't come to God and he starts tracing your sin backwards. You see, that's why some of your marriages fail, right? That's why some of your marriages fail. Thank you, sit down. That's why some of your marriages fail very easily. Now, I've had a relatively good marriage. And if you have a good marriage and you're the only one that knows it, then it's not real. There's no one that has stayed in my house that doesn't come to the same conclusion. If you live in my house for two weeks, you want to get married. It's been the testimony. Now, does that mean this woman has not hurt me? In a marriage where you hurt each other just two times every year, out of 365 days, there are only two days that your wife does something that you react to, that you don't like, that you have to talk to her, or she has to talk to you. That is a very good marriage, oh. Very, 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 very. <laughs> but see what happens when you forgive and you don't forget. After 24 years, you have 48 offenses. That is enough for your heart to be so rigidly cold, you can't love anymore. That warm feeling is gone because you can remember what she did in 2005, January, and what she did in August of the same year. Then in 2006, you can remember what she did in March and what she did in November of the same year. And then you can... You can never keep loving until you offer each other unlimited forgiveness. Offense kept causes the heart to go calloused and feelings die. You see, one of the things that had helped me be a good husband is I've been a marriage counselor also. It's part of my ministry. 
from the start, from 95, I've always been in marital counseling. And just when I think my wife is not perfect, one woman will call me, Daddy, I want to come and talk to you. And they always open up to me, not knowing they are helping me. <laughs> They'll come and start describing something and even crying over it. The feeling at that time is, I don't, I can't, I can't, are you not sounding stupid to yourself? What are you crying over? You had a problem here. But of course I don't say that. I have to counsel and lead them by the word and the spirit of love back to the right path. Then I go home and say, Kai, my wife is very good. <laughs> Her own problem is not up to this one. <laughs> I say, what? What if it's this one I mistakenly married that time? My body, my body would have been much more. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, learn to get over yourself. If you are sitting here and there's a haunting memory, you think God has not gotten over it. It's not God at all, though. And he said, I should tell you, it's not God at all. It's your problem. Most of the time, it's your pride. Pride makes you not to forgive yourself. Pride puts you where you want to be right all the time. So if you're ever wrong, you avoid facing the fact. Or, at, or you try to punish yourself. So that you can justify that. Yes, I did wrong, but I also suffered for it. Invalidating the sufferings of Jesus on your behalf. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Until that is established, you can't even start the journey. This is the journey of Allowing the presence of God to work out your carnality so that the spirit of God in your inner man can have free operation in your soul and in your flesh. Because grace is locked up on the inside. Power is locked up on the inside. Revelation knowledge brings the release of exousia. But it is spiritual labors that brings the release of dunamis. Revelation knowledge brings the release of exousia. But it is spiritual labors that brings the release of dunamis. I think it was A.W. Tozer that wrote a book, The Release of the Spirit. Was it? Who is that author? Tozer? It's still the same watchman name. The Release of the Spirit. Tunde Balanta wrote also a very good book. Those of you who know him, if you are from Kaduna here, go look for that book, Brokenness. So it's about the same concept. See, because we bear this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the glory may be of God, not of man. You are the earthen vessel. Your flesh has encased the power so that nobody can see it. Nobody can see the glory of God that you carry. The day Jesus cried, It is finished. What happened to the temple in Jerusalem? The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's the veil of the Holy of Holies, where the Shekinah, where, where the ark used to be kept. God disclosed it and said, I don't need this building again. So can, can I pass a little warning? I don't see, think any Christian should rejoice at the prospect of the Jews building a third temple. Because a third temple being built is an affront to Calvary. They want to resume the sacrifice of animals again. And that is blasphemy. Jesus has already died. The last sacrifice of the Levitical lineage of priesthood has been offered. So God can never again honor a sacrifice made on the temple mount in any building made by human hands in Israel. They are going to do it eventually. But because of our affinity to Israel, I see even Christian networks broadcasting the progress towards that. And that's why the book of Hebrews was written to correct the church. If you go back to animal sacrifices, you have denied the blood and you have lost your salvation. It's a dangerous thing. So we can still be friends of Israel. But don't push them into idolatry. Rather preach Christ to them. Their Messiah has come. 
I've been to Israel a number of times and I'm surprised the Jews are still waiting for Messiah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Okay, let me conclude. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, 23, Paul talked about the three parts of you. I pray God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Can you say I'm a spirit being? I have a soul. I live in a body. That's the way we have been saying it for some decades now to give us easy understanding. Spirit, soul, and body. Numa suche soma. Numa suche soma. The pneuma is the spirit. The suture is the soul. And the body is called the soma. S-O-M-A. That's the way you are made. The spirit of God moved out of that temple and came to live in you. You are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you have an outer court, the flesh. The holy place, the soul. And your holy of holies where his Shekinah is locked up is the pneuma. You see, when God counts, he counts from inside out. When we operate, we operate from outside in. When he was describing the tabernacle to, to Moses, he started describing the Holy of Holies first. Then came to the outer court and described it. And described, I mean, the holy place then there. That's how he always does his things. Say amen. I said say amen. amen. So by the same interpretive application, this is the interpretive part of the message right now. You can know how to assess the glory within so that that oil can flow out. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, I put under my body, I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I should be, become disqualified. Who is the I that puts under the body? The inner, inner man. The spirit has to bring the soul and the body under control. As long as your soul and body are running riots, you are caging the glory. God holds back the glory for your own good. Because when glory mixes with sin, it creates an explosion called judgment. That's what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. So when God holds back that flow from within, it is to preserve you. He is having mercy on you. Because your flesh is still too dominant. There's too much carnality in your soul. Are you getting me? So this process, you can engage it through worship. It doesn't matter which the spiritual exercise you use. The spiritual exercise you use most of the time is dependent on your, your discipling process. Who disciples you determines the spiritual exercise that is easiest for you to do. You grow up in a fasting environment, you are a fasting machine. Some of us grew up where praying in tongues was a culture. You just pray in tongues for five hours. Why? Just to pray in tongues. You don't have to have a topic to pray in tongues. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edified himself. So you just walk up and down and charge yourself up for five hours. That's how we grew up. Three hours. Sometimes you want to spend the whole day talking in tongues and praise God for the whole day. What are you doing? You are just fellowshipping. So what were you praying about? You don't have to be praying about anything. Building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So whether you're fasting or worshiping or praying in tongues or doing intercession, the first challenge you experience is with the outer court, the flesh. How do you know your flesh is resisting spiritual activity? You feel tired. Now, how many of you have been alert watching 9 p.m. news? And then you say, oh, I've not read my Bible today. The moment you pick the Bible, you fell asleep. That's the flesh reacting. You feel sleepy. You feel uncomfortable sitting. You feel uncomfortable standing. Suddenly, you are aware that your knees are paining you. Sounds familiar? That's the flesh level of operation. That's the flesh level of operation. Suddenly you are hungry and the, the, the flesh tells you just go and put some food in there, you'll be able to pray better. But if you break that prayer and go and eat food, you will fall asleep. 
And this is the level some people stay on their life. The moment the flesh starts speaking, they start responding. So the flesh limits them forever. What you need to learn to do is to persist. Keep the activity up until the flesh keeps quiet. I put my body under. I bring it under subjection. You have to will it from the inside. Because the Spirit of God is in you. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, I quoted it a number of times this morning. He is in you, working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if you pay attention to within, God doesn't want you to stop. So don't respond to the flesh. The flesh is not boss. Your spirit is. Your spirit is. So what do you do? Ignore the flesh. Tell your neighbor, ignore the flesh. Persist. This is where I tell people that don't be too distracted or don't be discouraged if you find that you fell, fall, fell asleep. Sleep that came while you are praying is part of the prayer. Now, I am not saying that so that the moment you feel sleepy, you arrange yourself. <laughs> Put pillow under your head. <laughs> I am aware of the infirmities of your flesh. And I sleep the whole night. Wake up 7 a.m., not even 5 a.m. this time. The following morning, it's the sun that wakes you up. He said, Reverend Victor told me, when I sleep, it is part of the prayer. That is not what I am saying. But sometimes you can't control it. It overwhelms you and you discover that you have been asleep for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. When you, the moment you become conscious, continue prayer. It has not broken anything. You see what some people do? They will blame the devil immediately. They will say, Asmondi, Sukumbus, Inkumbus. I know all those kubus came around and they would just pack their Bible and say, mm, I'm being oppressed, I can't pray. It's just your flesh. Your flesh is, not, is enough trouble without the devil being present. Yes! Tell your neighbor, stay there. Yeah. Keep on doing it. Keep at it. But if you keep at it, Depending on the degree of carnality you had operating before you started the exercise, whether you're fasting or praying. You know, sometimes the fast kicks in on the second day because you are in the spiritual flow before you started fasting. Sometimes the fast really, I mean fast when you're in the spiritual fast now, doesn't kick in until day seven. For seven full days you are wrestling. The kitchen is calling you. Food that is being cooked three houses away, your nursery speak it. And some people will go and break their fast. If you want to use fasting to assess God's presence, don't break it. You say, I can't pray. Don't pray, but keep the fast. Sometimes we fast and pray. Sometimes we pray and fast. Sometimes we just fast. <laughs> After some time, you just discover the flesh. Just keep quiet. What myself and my wife call the Mechiono anointing will catch the flesh. <laughs> the flesh will just keep quiet. You are not even conscious of the flesh anymore. <clears throat> At that point, can I have a, a drink of water? Even when you sleep, you, even when you lie down, you may not necessarily fall asleep. When you kneel down, you don't feel uncomfortable. When you are walking up and down your room, you are not feeling tired. Because the flesh has been subdued. Tell your neighbor, subdue the flesh. But you know what? You, do, you can't tell where you make the transition. It depends. It's all situation specific. But the moment you make the transition, the soul wakes up. The suche, the mind, the will, and emotions comes alive. Oh, and that's another place of struggle. That's another place of real struggle. How do you know you're in this holy place and the soul is resisting you? Thoughts, imaginations, distracting ideas. And you see, when the flesh is already under, sometimes you start prayer and you're already in the holy place. The flesh didn't disturb you because it has been under control. You see, what you feed is what grows. That's why there's great danger in this 
Sin, repent. Obey the flesh, repent. Obey the flesh. The more, the more you are doing that, you are training your flesh to be dominant. So anytime you want to seek God, you will spend so much time in the outer court. But when you learn to, learn to keep the flesh under constantly, you can get into prayer or get into fasting or get into praise or get into tongues like some of us like doing. And suddenly, you are already in the holy place. What happens when you are in the holy place? The soul resistance. The factors of the soul, thoughts, imaginations, ideas that are contrary to the engagement at that point. You begin to remember what you really needed to do before you started this prayer. Have you been there? Some things begin to be very urgent. Just make that call. Just make that call. Make that call. Make that call. Sometimes I've been there and unconsciously my hand moves to my phone. Unconsciously I go to my WhatsApp. Somebody said, some, something tells me, somebody has sent you a message you need to read. You can shorten your time in the holy place by turning off your phone or putting it on silent and facing it down so that you don't even hear the beeping. Because when you keep gadgets like that around you, you are prolonging your stay. Anything that feeds your soul from outside will limit the speed with which you get to where the Lord feeds your soul from inside. Guys, this is where some of us have issues. Because we are visual beings. And sometimes pictures register that you didn't even know registered. You were scrolling through what, uh, Instagram. And then this lady did the skimpy thing. Showing everything God blessed her with. And you quickly scrolled. You scrolled this through blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Now, that's what a Christian would do. Ask your neighbor, are you a Christian? Because some of you will stop and stare. And after absorbing all it all, you will now say, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, Father. <laughs> if you did that, your struggle here will be longer when the devil comes with it. Because even that momentary flash... Satan has a way of bringing it back in HD colors. When you are in that place of longing, you are thinking holiness, then you see nudity. Some people react and say, why am I this like this? It's the devil. It's the devil. The windows are here. They should understand the pronunciation. Devil. That's what Benima they call devil. Devil. D-E-V-O. Say it's the devil, it's the devil. Shut up, no be devil, now your mind. You remember hearts. Things you thought you have forgiven suddenly show up again. What do you do at that soul struggle level? Learn to use the scriptures to counter whatever Satan brings. Speak what is contrary. I would say, for instance, and this is the will of God, even my sanctification. I have abstained from all sexual immorality. It's not part of my life. And instantly, that picture will vanish away. If it's a heart, I would say something like, I forgive people freely and readily, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven me. If a name is involved, I'll say, John, I forgive you again. May the Lord bless you. You see, if you have the mindset of fall down and die for your enemies, there are realms of glory you will never assess. Because when Satan brings memories, you, become, you begin your own style of warfare prayer. And your warfare is not against demons, devils, and evil spirits. Your warfare is against men. People you think don't like you. Who told you man is your problem? Satan uses men. But you should first tackle the devil. Before you bother about men. Okay, let me not step on too many toes. I know some people are drunk with those things. If it is working for you, continue. Did I say that at the beginning? Uh, if it is working for you. But there are higher realms. There are realms beyond that you are not touching. 
Glory to God. I said glory to God. In 1991, they told me my uncle in the village who had built shrines in our name. Until he dies, I will never make progress, whether spiritual or otherwise. In 1991, as I was finishing university, the man finally died in 2017. So imagine if I was waiting for him to die. This is why some of you have stopped. The people you have been saying should fall down and die are getting fatter, fresher. And your mind tells you until they die, you can't make progress. And you keep quoting, greater is he that is in you. How is he greater if he can't tame them? See, if you are a witch and wizard and you come after me, now you go tired. I'm telling you the truth. If I move into a neighborhood there's witchcraft, they move out or they die. And I don't even have to tell them to die. It happened several times while I was in Makodi here. One time, seven neighbors died in two weeks without my mentioning their name. It was just that every time I got up to go to the wake keep, when they put the pan front, God would say, go back, he's, there. he's one of the people. I took him out. That kept happening for two weeks, seven of them. Then there was calm. Your God is a God of vengeance. So. Said, I will recompense, said the Lord. He said, vengeance is mine. The challenge with some of you, why God can't fight for you, is that you have taken the vengeance for yourself. And most of the time, your calculations are wrong. The people you think are hurting you may not be the ones who. Some enemies, some enemies can look harmless. No, no, harmless. If it's enemy, it has to be harmless. If you are not from Nigeria, you don't even know what I have just said. But this is a Nigerian joke everybody here understands. Glory to God. Keep at it. Use the scriptures. Keep at it. Suddenly the mind calms down. Those agitating thoughts and passions just fizzle away. That is when true praying in the spirit kicks in. You could have been talking in tongues all this while for a one hour already. You see, there's a difference between praying with the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. All praying in tongues is praying with the Spirit, but not all praying in tongues is praying in the Spirit. What, when is it praying in the Holy Spirit? When you are no longer praying, prayer prays you. It begins to gush out of the inner man. Your tongue is moving automatically. Even when you want to stop, there's an overflowing urge from within. Ah, then you have entered the holy place. I mean the holy of holies. You see, in the outer court and in the holy place, you notice time. In the holy of holies, you don't notice time. 30 minutes looks like 5 minutes. In the outer court, 30, 5 minutes looks like 30 minutes. When you're in a prayer meeting and looking at watch, it's because you are operating from the outer court. If even in a prayer meeting, when you enter that realm, I'm telling you, when they want to stop, you find it difficult to stop. That's why after service, some people hang out, still praying, because they entered the realm while the service was going on. That is where true communion begins. That's true. See, in the outer court and in the holy place, you use prayer points. Prayer points can assist you to keep praying and persisting. Once you kick into the holy of holies, prayer points come irrelevant. Even if there's a list before you, you can't go back to them. The prayer topics flow out of your heart. The Holy Spirit has become your co-laborer. You see, the degree of virtue you will operate in from day to day is not dependent on how much time you spent in the outer court or in the holy place. It's how much time you spent in the holy of holies. So don't labor for two hours and hit this realm and spend five minutes there. You just cheated yourself. You cheated yourself. Once you break in there, hang out with God as long as it is possible. Because the longer you hang out with God, the easier it is to get back to that realm when next you come back. Because it's why you are communing with him, oblivious of the flesh and the soul, that he purges your soul and tames your flesh. 
things get taken care of. The practice of psychiatry and, uh, is it psychiatry? The people that Americans call shrinks. Or psychology. Uh-huh. It's a growing practice in Nigeria. I'm not one of those really rejoicing at it. Though I know it, it does some good. It's good for society, but not good for the church. Don't take issues to the world that has a shorter course of healing in the church. I don't care whether it's trauma of war or trauma of rape or trauma of betrayal or trauma. You want to know who Satan has thrown trauma with? I'm over here. The things I have seen in this life, if I put one quarter of it on some of your neck, your neck will bend. But why am I not living under that weight? And you say some people that stab you want you to steal in the juice of the heart. So the greatest disappointment is when they see you free. When they see you visiting psychologists over and over again, you sit down for therapy hour after hour, explaining, my mother was a brute. My mother used to flog us with oliwo. <laughs> my father used to cane us with military belt. He would stone me against the wall. He blah, 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 blah. Why you are going through all that, you are relieving it, you are scratching the wound, you make it bleed afresh. If you can assess God's manifest presence this way, why you are fellowshipping with God, he takes care of those things. You do that over and over again, and one day you can't even remember the event. Suddenly, it's so healed that you can see the scar and feel no pain. You can remember the event and there's no inner discomfort. There's no inferiority complex. There's no sense of unworthiness. There's no... No, I, I went, walked into a meeting once and saw someone that did me bad many years ago. And I jumped on him, I hugged him. The honest truth is if he had hugged me back, I will never have remembered because the matter was gone. This is how he stood. I'm holding him, he's standing like this, looking at me with suspicion like, is this for real? Are you just doing this because people are here? Then I, oh, oh, he was one of them. <laughs> That's when I remembered. Get into the presence of God and get healed. People who, be, who know I believe so much in sexual purity and teach it were shocked in Abuja when one celebrity came up accusing a pastor of one thing or the other, the other day. And then they expected me to lash the pastor. And I said, why? What's the problem? Somebody said they are born again and then for 21 years they have not been healed. I'm not clapping for the sin if it ever happened. But I'm not clapping to you, for you for keeping bitterness for 21 days as if the Holy Spirit is important. You say, I've lived under the shadow of that event for 21 days, 21 years. You really, if you were not born again, I'd have no problem with you. Go to a psychologist, psychiatry, psychoanalyst, psycho, psycho, and become psycho yourself. But if you're a child of God and you have been assessing presence, I know what presence does. So that was an announcement of your own carnality. And I was not going to celebrate that. And people around me were shocked. I had to explain. Let God roll your burdens away. And listen to me, you do this repeatedly, it becomes so easy to get there until one day you enter your prayer room and say, Jesus, and you're already there. And when that begins to happen, don't become full of yourself. You see, spiritual pride is the worst form of pride. And it has cost many people intimacies that began, they labored into it. Then they started boasting about it. You can share the testimony to challenge other people's faith. That's not what I'm saying, it's a boast. I'm talking about bragging as if nobody else can reach there. No. We all have access. Equal access under the covenant. Number two expression of that pride is when you stop doing the practice because you think you have a corner on God. Because you see, that place is so sweet, oh. 
You sit in somebody's car and they start worshipping. They came to carry you to the supermarket and you enter their car and they can't drive anymore. They are lost in the spirit. You brought something. You see, you stay with God until God stays with you. He begins to follow you out. That's, it is out of that overflow, dynamics begins to manifest. It's not by praying for power. Send out your power, we pray you, O oh Lord. And most of the time when people are praying that, singing all those songs, they're actually looking for power so that they can show somebody how mighty they are. Listen to me, I'm going to pray for the sick a little while from now. I am not bothered whether you think I'm a great man of God or not. It's not part of my psyche. Praise does not intoxicate me. Criticism won't move me. That's why I can freely pray for the sick. If you're always thinking, what would they say if the person doesn't get healed? You will never start. Why am I going to pray for the sick? Because I love you. I don't want you to continue this conference with your pain. I want you to be free for, from pain for the rest of the conference. You enjoy the conference more and you live here with a testimony. It glorifies Jesus. It's all about you and him, not about me. So I'm going to use all the faith I have and all the anointing upon me to pray for everyone that comes forward. I, definitely, time is short. We can't heal, get everybody healed tonight. But sitting where you are, you can take it. But you know, that's why we have six more days. Say amen. Apostle Odoma is here. He's very anointed. <laughs> Dr. Ogwele will be with us tomorrow evening. He's very anointed. And even if we didn't come, the man of the house has enough of it. So don't get up. When I pray for people, I'm not interested whether you fall or not. Some people fall. I'm interested in you getting healed. So don't try to impress me by throwing yourself on the ground. Glory to God. I'm not here to impress. Even if you don't have faith to be healed, I can heal you on the basis of my faith and anointing. If you just accept me as a man of God, he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. The responsibility is on me. It's a fight between me and Satan, not you. You are just a territory for expression. So please, please, <clears throat> when I minister, huh? And ask you questions. Talk fact. Let me talk fit. I will always ask you questions. Well, everybody has their own style. Okay? The way God uses them. Okay? In Ben Hing's meetings, people get healed and come up to testify. In my own meetings, I come down there and engage you. The one on one. I, can, I don't just want to walk, up, walk out or lay hands on you and mm -mm, mm -mm. If I say, has the pain left? If it has reduced, say it has reduced. But it has not totally gone. We will pray again. Jesus prayed for one blind person two times. If Jesus can do it two times, I can do it 200 times. <laughs> I say, now Satan go tired. No be me oh. No, me go tired. I'm on assignment. And I know it works. I've seen too many healings. I've seen the raising of the dead. I've seen all kinds of things happen over the years. That not, it's not even as if when you say you are healed, I will now lose my mind. You are really healed. Now, sometimes it can really amaze me. I don't lose a touch of, um, a sense of awe at the works of God. But that doesn't mean when I go to bed tonight, I won't be able to sleep. And I'll be thinking, somebody's eyes opened in this meeting. Kai, I will sleep and get ready for tomorrow's ministry. Because it's all about him. Can we make it all about him tonight? I said, can we make it all about him tonight? And I think this is all we can take tonight. Because that glory that is in you, that fullness of Christ you have, there's a labor that breaks the shell of the flesh so that it can flow out. When there's a greater manifestation of it, it's not that 
it's something came from heaven whatever you are experiencing has been around for 2000 years it's just a breaking forth now acknowledge we have different offices and different giftings but even that it is these labors that release what is yours that is in you that's why you hear all these men of God they all have testimonies of some rigorous time of intense intimacy to become who they are and it's time for you to engage yourself you will leave this conference with all the passion the zeal the revelation the drive to make your life count in the kingdom of God I'm praying for you now you will leave this conference with all the revelation the drive the zeal the passion to make your life count in the kingdom of God and Satan will not be able to push you back anymore. Yeah. Your days of getting discouraged in the outer court is over forever. Yeah. Your days of getting discouraged in the holy place is over forever. Yeah. You will, if you operate this way, you will need to sit between, before a man explaining all your problems. And then tomorrow when they want to build their blog, they start writing your story. Then you start reacting. No. Jesus has your solution. Particularly if you're a leader, you're a pastor. You must do this. You must do this. So that you can operate properly in ministry. Let's rise up. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Mm -hmm. Your very word spoken to me, and I. some people have a challenge with that song because they only operate from the seat angle. That song is written from the walk angle. So some things we argue about. Your experience with your God is your experience. You see, some of us have been planted by rivers of living water, not just a river. Those who are planted by one river, they have just one view. 
And so they'll say, how can you say I'm lost without you? You already have him. You have him in your positional life. But you need more of him in your experiential walk. So it is... lift your hands and whisper to him your Lord Jesus the son of God Jesus the son of man Jesus the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world Jesus the king of kings and lord of lords Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah very soon we are going to shout and cry the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ and he shall reign. We look forward to your coming, Lord Jesus. Hey! We worship you. Listen to me, my role and the role of every man of God, we are God's law enforcement officers. I can't give you what God has not already given you. In fact, by the stripes of Jesus, you were already healed. So the pain or discomfort in your body, no matter what the doctor said, it's a lie. Jesus took your infirmities and carried your sicknesses. So he borrowed this from somewhere and gave it to you. Your own Jesus carried. I say your own Jesus carried. Yeah. But Satan is a thief. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's why God hired some of us, recruited some of us to go and enforce the law. If somebody took your phone from your pocket and the CCTV picked him up and they called me as a policeman and we traced the man and get the phone back for you, did I dash you anything? Is that a present from me? I just recovered what was yours. I said I just recovered what was yours. There's an anointing on me to recover what is yours. Now we're going to start a bit Please be seated. Okay? We're going to be very brief about this. You're going to see how beautiful it is. If you're here and there's obvious pain, you're the one I want out here first. We're going to pray for other people. But if there's obvious pain in any part of your body, there's a discomfort that you are conscious of while you are sitting in the meetings, please, come out here. You see, if you have HIV, for instance, you may not be in obvious pain. When you get healed, you need to go and run a test to prove it. Hello. 
But if you, if you broke your waist or broke your ankle or you have a tumor that is painful, you, you don't have to go. When you, you are healed, you know it immediately. So that's why we're starting with you. Can you also ask control the crowd once there's a, a good line, hold everybody back. I don't want too many people in front. Nobody behind anybody. Just one single line. Pastor Martins, keep the musical background I like while ministering. No two people behind. If you can't stand in front, please go back to your seat. Uh -huh. I will. We are still going to come back to you. We are still going to come back to you. We are still going to come back to you. I believe you are the son of Who believes that God sent this man to get you healed today? Is there anybody that believes that? Your hands went off first. Come on here. I believe you died. Pastor Prince, like, can you walk with me? Again. I want you here. I believe you made for us all. I normally have I leg pain if I sit for long. long. So when you were sitting, you were having the pain. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the pain. Jesus heals you now. Standing in I would need a lady here. Mama, can you come? You can't touch some places, you know. Just tap her legs in Jesus' name. Receive the power. Look at me. Look at me. Move your legs immediately. And tell me how you feel. Is the pain still there? Tell me what's happening. I think I know what's happening to her. Don't you? Okay, now listen to me. On a scale of 100, 0. Why are there tears in your eyes? You are emotional. You see? <laughs> 0 is no pain. 100 is the pain you had before. Where are we? When? Already. Say it again. I'm okay already. You are okay already. There's no pain at all. Now, who did that? Who did that? Jesus. Do you believe Jesus will do that for you? What was pain in your body? You fell from an upstairs last year. October. Head on the ground. I didn't break anything, but I fell with one side and from the waist down to my leg has been disturbing me since October. Last year, since October last year. Long sit down for long hallelujah you help me jesus said when we place our hands on sick people they get well so we'll fulfill that part he's doing his part muscles bones tendons tissues ligaments be healed thank you jesus look at me say thank you father for my healing bend down touch your toes immediately <laughs> are you from the Pentecostal church? Yeah, they are the ones that <laughs> find it difficult to get healed. So, it, it. you didn't know that was what I was about to say. Put your own hands there. Look at me. What do you see in my eyes? How can you describe it? Do I look like I'm wondering whether you'll be healed? In the name of Jesus. Sometimes we have to help some people connect. The power of God just went through you. Second dose. Third dose. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 Something is happening in your body. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Now, sometimes you give expression to the Holy Spirit as it moves on you. There's nothing wrong with that. Like the first lady told us, I'm emotional. So she began to shed tears. The power of God is at work in your body. I'm coming back to you. What's... Hmm? Ulcer pain. Put your hands there. Okay. It's thoracic ulcer. You demon. Go! 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 Thank you, Jesus. I saw something like a leech. Just out of you now. Just fly out of you. What would you have done before that would intensify the pain? If you drink water, do you feel any more discomfort? Yes. Or anything? If you take anything, you feel. Get me a bottle of water. Cries out for the Almighty. Rabba Kanishtai Kesposuli Danina. Let it not be as if God only loves the ladies. Give her water to drink and tell me how you feel. Don't worry, I'm coming back to you. Drink it in the way it would have hurt you before. You feel no hurt at all. My heart cries out for the Almighty. Tell me how you feel. Cries out for the Almighty. Having this pain for my chest. Can we have power here? Okay, it's not on. If I came out, I was having this pain from my chest to my back. I can hardly feel it. Okay, stretch. Stretch now. It's not there at all. No, not at all. Who did that? Always give him the glory. Sir, where is the pain? My heart cries out for long. It's considered a serious headache. What is that? Ulcer. Ulcer. For too long. Then each time I want to, each time I want to uh, uh, fast, I will start having a swollen, swollen leg on my, my, my legs. You will go and fast as long as you can. God heals your kidneys now. God heals your liver in the name of Jesus. God heals ulcer. Stomach ulcer, right? Stomach ulcer. Stomach also. In the name of Jesus. Yes. I receive. Go. I command the spirit of infirmity to go. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> you felt that? The power of God just ran through you. Did you feel that? <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. If I give you an instruction, will you obey it? Go eat something pepperish. Go eat pepper. They won't fool any calls. Fefe, fefe. Go and eat fefe. And you report back tomorrow. Because you will feel no discomfort anymore. Your ulcer is gone. God bless you. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God said you are getting more than a healing. I don't know what he's doing right now, but making me lift your hand. Lord, give her everything you have for her today. In the name of Jesus. Take it all. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Give me your hand. Give me your hand. Hold her second hand. Help me pull her up. Mama, help hold her second hand. Help me pull her up. You're getting up. I insist you get up and get healed. Now, look at me. Don't be afraid to tell me what is happening with you. Are you feeling more pain or less pain? Okay, okay. That's a trick of the devil. He's not the one acting, okay? Sometimes the power of the Lord comes and that's what happens. In the name of Jesus. Okay, go ahead and lie down here. This place is anointed. You're not living here with pain in your body. I know that. I know that I know that I know. 
This is why we hunger. And do you know why lying down? Please don't pray. I beg you. You can't give and receive at the same time. The power of God is already upon you. So just keep saying things like, Thank you, Father, for healing me. Can you help me say that? No matter what you feel. Thank you, Father, for healing me. And the moment you are free from pain, get up and let us know. Okay, you are still here. God bless you. You can go back to your seat. You can go back to your seat. Is there somebody here that can barely walk? You, come. Somebody, help her. This is what we hunger for. That should be a stroke. This or what made, what made you like that? They say this meningitis. This is God wants us to deal with it. This is what we ask for. This is Go! what we hunger for. This is what we pray for every day. This is this is what we ask for. This is what we ask for. This is what we hunger for. This is what we pray for every day. This is what this is what this is what we ask. We ask for. Over 15 years, and some now I don't have half the rap that is here. It will come. I hope you didn't pull her up by yourself. She was trying to get up. Good. She's the one trying to get up. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Muscles, joints, become limber. Every damaged cell is healed by the power of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. The meningitis is gone. In the name of Jesus. All internal organs be healed. You spirit of infirmity, you Unclamp your filthy hands right now and get out of this body. Get out. Thank you, Lord. My heart cries out. You are feeling heat, but the pain is gone. That heat is the power of God. That's what took your pain away. Hallelujah. Drop this. You said what? Knee replacement. You had knee replacement. Okay, a surgery. Okay. You walk out of here without pain today. In the name of Jesus. Father, complete the work. Stepping on it. Lebrando G. Crackle is the Cassudi branch dying of his position. Look at me. Okay. You actually walked here. So there's a measure to which you can walk. Just start putting more pressure on it. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. 
Okay. Okay. She's standing. Let me hear from her. I'm coming. I started with her before you got here. <laughs> oh, is that why you people were shouting? I heard a shout and I didn't know why. I I feel a lot relieved now and I can do I can try to do what I've not done before. Like what I couldn't do before. Okay, try some of it. Oh, is that the same person that was crying? Sometimes, most times, when I want to bend my waist, my waistline to start making sounds when I want to sit, stuff like that. But now, I go and sit down. Go and sit down. Walk up back here. <laughs> hey, somebody shout unto the Lord. Take a hold of my hand. Something jumped into you while that was going on. I don't even know how to know what is wrong with you. You are healed in Jesus' name. Check it. Check it. Check it immediately. Where was the pain? Okay, it's peptic ulcer. Okay, now stretch, stretch. Look for it. And tell me. I hope you didn't disconnect. Something jumped into you. I saw it. Been for a long time. I feel like yes. I have to take some Bye. seconds or like 31 minutes before I could stand up. 30 minutes? Th 30 seconds to one minute Th okay. before I could stand up once I bent to sweep okay. for a long time. So it's been like that plus the peptic ulcer. The pain leaves your back, the pain leaves your spine, the pain leaves your waist area now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Can you say thank you, Lord Jesus? Mm -hmm. Bend down, touch your toes. Pain. You can't feel pain. I like your countenance. It's a countenance of joy. Hey, somebody celebrate Jesus. Please, put your hand at her back and your hand on her stomach. Put your hand. Let's complete the circuit. Ragadishi. 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 Thank you. Go, God bless you. Go back to your seat. Tell your neighbors what God did for you. Lebrakistaina. Now the truth is the more you watch this the more your own faith rises up and it becomes easier for you to get healed. Yes, you are feeling something right now. Start checking it again. Check it again. Check it again. Help her bend. Help her check herself. There's actually somebody, somebody I'm looking for. Are you the person? Yes. The pain began from a trauma. Who is that person? The pain actually began from a trauma. That's how many years ago? Yes, last year. Yes. So it's not actually a physical pain. I had an accident. Okay. So since after the accident, like a month later, that's when the trauma started. Okay. From the chest, from my breast, to my back, to my head, to my leg. Who is a mechanic here? Let me tell you how it happens. Moments of trauma opens a gap that demons can get in. Some of those post-traumatic pain is not physical. It's not that something was damaged that is beginning to show up. It is that in that moment of fright, your spirit opened up and a demon of pain got into your flesh. That's why doctors can't treat it. You can't inject spirit away. So God said, I should cast that spirit out of you. That doesn't mean you are demon-possessed. It's in your flesh. Are you ready for that? In the name of Jesus. Go! Both the pain and the fear. 
in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, that's the Holy Ghost. All of it. And a spirit of joy overtakes you now. Give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise. For... <laughs> 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 Rovers used my chair on my head. And then after that, I had an accident. And I had a call to teach in the same place. In the same place here. Yes, it's prayer. It's not just pain, it's prayer. Prayer, yes, prayer for all my altar. And sometimes the devil tells you there's a permanent damage internal. The doctor even said I will live with it forever. <laughs> Can you say the doctor lied? Jesus takes it away right now. Jesus Christ in the name. Sir, can I ask you to kneel down, please? Oh, oh, Dr. Jesus does it for you now. Oh. Now, because of time, because of time. Now, the reason I stayed with some people is so that you can see what God is doing here. Now, I'm going to go around and lay hands on you. And I want you to just take it. How do you take it? The moment I lay hands on you, check yourself. Can you do that for me? I said, can you do that for me? So that we're not closing by 2 a.m. Because it just takes a moment. I helped some people to interact with the anointing so that I can build your faith. In the name of Jesus Christ. And when I walk up to you, just declare, I'm healed from so and so. Then I put my hands on you. Can we start with you? He said I should start with you. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. He touched me. Oh, what joy I feel. Oh, what joy that fills my soul. Something happens. It happens to me. It happens to me. Now, Pastor Gabe, all of you, keep examining all those I lay hands upon. He touched me. back pain as I have ulcer and a pain around this, my right breast but while you were praying for someone I felt it I touched it and there's no pain anymore no hallelujah pain. all of it gone in Jesus name just 
a demonic scratch. You feel the scratching. Periodically. I see a millipede. That's what I see in my spirit. In the name of Jesus. An enemy discovered is an enemy conquered. You devil, go! All of it, gone. Bring him back. Raman. I'm sure of it. Go! I'm sure of it. He touched me. Oh, something happens to me. Something happened. And now I know. I had uh, like a star here uh, that has been there for years. So when you were praying, like I felt something leave my hand from here, and it's been there for ages, for a long time. Someone said it's because someone um, they made to uh, just but like um, did something, but it's it didn't gone. work. It's Thank gone. you. Jesus. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. He touched me and made. It's gone. 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 It's It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's Wholeness come to you. You came here with faith tonight. That's what the Lord told me. Yes. From hospital, I rushed down here immediately. Yeah. And he's doing it completely. Amen. Now just keep your hands up. In the name of Jesus. No, 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 amen. Just receive. Wholeness come to you from Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you,
Thank you, Lord. All of you, please. Can I have, please, man of God, can you join? I don't want anyone to go here out of here thinking nobody touched them. Please, the two of you, can you join me here? Mama, come over, Pastor Prince. Like, just lay hands on the rest of the people quickly. Just quickly, please. We do this out of compassion, not, not, not anything else. I'm sorry we have spent a little more time than we should. Now I know, I know. <laughs> huh? still, I can still feel it. It's not gone just yet. You can still feel it where? Okay, put your hands there. Something, yeah. Something. Yeah. Can you say pain? Say pain. You leave my body now. Pain, you will leave my body now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Go sit down and check it again. Now, anyone that needs healing, get up right now. Nobody needs to touch you. But those who came out, they are touching them and they are going back. Just touch them, let them go back. The power of God is operating there. Lord God Almighty. Our desire is the rest of this week. Everyone here will enjoy a pain-free, discomfort-free week. They have come into your presence. So your power invade their flesh. Dematerialize all tumors and cancers. Take all pain away. Spirit of infirmity, I break your power. You leave everyone under the sound of my voice. Even those outside. Go! In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Can you say, Jesus Christ of Nazareth makes me whole now. Say it again. Say it again. Shout it the last time. 